How about exploring the ordinary and the extraordinary both in the house and garden? It's all coming up. Alan Smith, welcome to the show. I don't know about you, but I am a hopeless collector of so many things. Well, it just makes my head spin. And I'm also a big pack rat. I save everything. But I love to find things that are ordinary, but have an extraordinary twist to them or an extraordinary use. For instance, just take a look at these dried allium or onion heads. This one is called Allium Schubertii. It's an ornamental onion that I grow that blooms in the spring. It looks like a big sparkler right in the middle of the garden. And I just love its amethyst to lavender color. Now what's great about these is that you can dry them and you can use them inside in jugs like this. Not an ordinary jug, but I think a rather extraordinary one. These are face jugs, and a little later in the show, we'll see an impressive collection of this folk art. We'll also visit a garden in Holland with a collection of watering cans. What a fun way to have functional garden ornament. And if you're a plant collector like me, you'll be interested in seeing some of these amazing living wreaths. I also want to talk about soybeans. Again, a very ordinary thing, but we're going to put it to use in some extraordinary ways. We're going to head out to the Garden Home Retreat, and I'm going to show you how I'm insulating the house with them. And if this is not enough, a little later, this bean is transformed with Middle Eastern flair. So stay with us. I have to say, I'm always impressed by people who are avid collectors of something. It's just this whole idea of having such passion for things that they want to preserve. Well, it's just very inspiring. Take this collection of face jugs, a folk art that's becoming popular in certain parts of the United States. During a visit to North Carolina, I caught up with antique dealer Mary Wells, and I think we can safely call her a face jug expert after seeing her collection. In Holland, my friends George and Marianne Horgevorst began collecting water cans for their garden. Here's George to tell us about this functional garden ornament. I think one of the, the nicest aspects of this garden that helps also create interest is the garden ornament that is placed around. I mean, some things are, are very ordinary, like stacked clay pots and, and this uh, growing collection of watering cans that you and Marion have. Yeah, it will stop growing now because we decided to, to buy no more water cans. <laughs> too many. <laughs> because we have about 100 in the garden and it's getting too many. But we, we like to, to visit markets in the, or whatever, England, Belgium, north of France, and. Yeah, and walk around and see what we like to put in our garden. We're always looking for things in our garden. Right. Never in the house, always in the garden. <laughs> for the garden. And if you're like me and you like to collect plants, here's a group you should try, the succulents. They're truly water wise. That's just the way nature designed them to be. I had an opportunity to catch up with Margie Rader at Euro American to see her collection of succulents as well as her living reef designs. Well, Margie, I'm just loving your groovy little pad here you've put together. Well, thank you. It's fun. It's kind of our little, our retro pad. Sure. Well, it's a great display that shows how you can use these succulents in so many fun and interesting ways. Your, your artwork on the wall there is fabulous. Thank you. You always have to keep exploring the textures and the colors of succulents. Succulents have become very popular, haven't they? They've kind of like been reborn. I yeah. think they were big in the 70s. Yeah, yeah. And now they're kind of big again. In this one dish, it looks like you have about nine, maybe 10 varieties. Yes, at, at least. There might even be more. Um, the more variety, the more color, the more texture, the more interesting it is to the eye. And I think it gives you, you know, we have some gray planted here, we have some gray over here, so your eye kind of will flow. 
I and mean, it will be more harmonious. Well, it's a little garden. It's a little garden in a in a in a box. In a dish. Mm -hmm. And these, I think, these are so beautiful. I love the chartreuse glass. But as you can see, there's no there's no there's no drain hole. You know, I I use lots of containers that don't have any holes in them because they are succulents. You don't need to water them much, and I don't want to be limited. You know, I'm all, yeah, I don't want to. You see a great looking container, it's like, hey, let's get creative. Let's be creative, because not all of them can you drill a hole in the bottom. No. And you don't really need to with the succulents. But you have to be careful about not watering them too much. Right. Yeah. And you keep them on the dry side. And I do, I do say, if you say you watered it too much, if you'll just, um, you can hold the top of it and then just kind of drain the excess I water see, out yeah. if you think you've got too much water. Just decant it all. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's just gorgeous. It's just a great display. I just applaud your creative gifts. Thank you. I'm glad I can share it with you. After the break, simple ideas for starting color in your garden and ways of using everyday items in a new way. Plus, you won't want to miss this environmentally friendly insulation and it's going in at the garden home retreat. There's something about collecting bits and bobs and using them in creative ways. For me, really, that's the most fun. For instance, this particular piece is an umbrella stand, a beautiful chocolate brown ceramic. But rather than use it for umbrellas, I've used it as a colossal vase. It's perfect for all kinds of ornamental grasses or anything gathered out of the fall garden. And take a look at this old milk can. Now you can tell it's been around a while, painted black, it's ideal for using for sunflowers. And boy, did we grow a bounty of sunflowers last year at the Garden Home Retreat. Those big giant mammoth yellow ones and that gorgeous Moulin Rouge, the one with the mahogany colored petals. And take a look over here at this old stool from the 1930s. I'm gonna change the color from this ochre yellow to something more in the chocolate range like this container. And as you can see, I've put another classic from the 1930s on it, a mother-in-law's tongue, sometimes called snake plant or Sansevieria. Now, if you're looking for a plant that can take very low light conditions, not a lot of water, just not a lot of love and still flourish, you ought to give Sansevieria a try. I just think it's a great looking plant. If you want something with a little more color, you might try the variegated variety as you can see here. Now, speaking of color, Last year, we tried a new system in our little greenhouse for growing colorful annuals from seed. You see, this is a system called an APS, or Accelerated Propagation System. And what it does is use a wick to pull moisture into the soil to help germinate seeds more quickly. So, were we successful? Well, just take a look. The summer carnival hollyhocks came up in about five to six days. The wicking system is keeping them nice and moist and soon they'll be ready for transplanting. Okay, now once the seeds have germinated, light becomes an important factor. In fact, sometimes adding a grow light to your seed starting system is a very good investment. Fluorescent lights or shop lights found at a hardware store can be used for growing plants indoors. In fact, this light gets high marks for excellent color development and stocky growth. Now you may think, well, we'll just put the seedlings into a windowsill. And that's fine if you have one little tray, but that's not going to be very efficient if you have a lot of plants. You'll want to keep the bulbs of your fluorescent light clean and change them out yearly. And consider adding some white poster board and also some strips of aluminum foil on the edge of the lamp to reflect more light back onto the plants. Now if you have a shelf or a closet or even an old cabinet, you can mount the lights there. If you don't, you can use a 1 by 12 by 6 inch board and concrete blocks to make a shelf. Mount the light fixtures on the boards using chains that can be raised or lowered depending on where the plant is in its development. Best of all, with a light system like this, you can set the timer and let the fluorescent lamp do the work. Up next, a trip to the Garden Home Retreat where we see an everyday plant, the soybean, being used in an extraordinary way. And a little later, taking edamame to the next level. Before the break, 
let's take a look at one more plant for bringing color into the garden. Now this little nemesia is not new. It's one called Bluebird. It's been around a while, but it's worth mentioning because it's still one of the best you can grow. Although it can stand up to heat better than some, the quality that I rely on is frost tolerance, so it's ideal for the early spring garden. Bluebird has a snapdragon-shaped, blue to purple flower that mixes beautifully with other cool season favorites, such as violas, ornamental kale, and pansies. My garden is constantly evolving and changing, and I'm not just talking about the waves of color from plants, I'm talking about what's below the surface. I'm always seeking out greener solutions, and by that I mean environmentally friendly ways of caring for the soil. So if I work this hard to create a green garden, why not an environmentally forward house too? When we began designing the Garden Home Retreat, I wanted to ensure that this house and garden would illustrate to visitors the latest innovations in thinking green. I employed simple solutions such as water conservation, tried out solar-driven products, chose materials with a history of performance such as brick, cypress wood, and metal roofing. And inside the house, I'm putting soybeans to work. Yes, the same soybeans you see growing in the fields throughout this country. Through a chemical process, these beans are transformed into a sprayable foam that makes an excellent insulation. Soy-based spray foam insulation is a two-component system. These two components are kept completely separate until the last half inch of the gun. That's where the two components mix together, hit the wall as a liquid, and expand up to a hundred times to seal any cracks, crevices, areas around pipes, windows, and doors that are your main concerns for air leakage. When discussing the pros and cons of fiberglass versus a soy-based spray foam insulation, the first thing I think of is with fiberglass it's definitely cheap to install and any insulation is going to be better than none at all for your home. The fiberglass insulation is cheaper up front and will provide some resistance to heat transfer but does not control the air infiltration being the main con of that product. The pros of the soy based spray foam is the air seal doesn't allow that air infiltration. One of the cons would be the higher upfront cost and the fact that trained professionals are needed to install that product versus where the fiberglass can be installed by any do-it-yourselfer out there. Although soy-based spray foam insulation does provide a complete air seal itself, it is not a cure-all product. The house is a system and all the parts and pieces need to work together in order to create the total energy efficient package. Your HVAC unit, your window quality, door quality, and other ingredients that make up a home are going to give you that complete air seal and the energy efficient home that you're looking for. You know these days you can find vineyards in just about every state from New Hampshire to New Mexico. We caught up with a couple from Texas who grow grapes and a lot more. Jim and Mary Lynn tell us more about their garden. She is really the gardener, but I do have a small vineyard. You know, I think the thing that needs to be said about vineyards, it's, it's not as hard. Sometimes I think we make it a little too technical, and it's really not that technical. Main thing is, is prune severely, and we did that a couple of weeks ago. And then you have to get on the spray program. Out of those plants, we can make 25 gallons of wine. So it's a fun project. Well, my favorite thing is the antique roses and the earth kind roses. By planting those, I don't ever have to spray, I never have to dust. I do mulch and I water and, I, and I, I'm in the soil when I plant them. I use cotton burr compost because our soil is very compacted. I think if whatever two people enjoy, if you can enjoy it together, it just enriches the whole marriage. And uh, I probably enjoy it more than he does, but because he loves me, he enjoys it too. <laughs> After the break, we're going to visit with Chef Chris Green with the Viking Cooking School. He's putting soybeans to work in a unique dish, so stay with us. I have to say, the only thing better than growing your own vegetables 
is enjoying them fresh from the garden. And I also like to experiment with lots of new and interesting things. This year I've tried lots of different Asian vegetables. If you've been to a Middle Eastern or Asian restaurant lately, you may have run across edamame or soybeans. They're used in lots of different ways. Chef Chris Green from the Viking Cooking School in Memphis shows us how to take edamame to the next level. Tofu isn't the only way to get your soy protein. Let's go back to the bean, the soybean. Just one half cup serving of soybeans will give you 11 grams of protein. That's almost a fifth of your daily requirements. Now, when we're working with soybeans, they usually come frozen in one of two forms. You can find them in the pod. These are great. You can serve them as a snack by simply boiling them three to five minutes, drain them, season them with a little salt and pepper, and you're good to go for a nice, healthy snack. Or you can buy them already shelled. These are going to be cooked three to five minutes also. So let's take them over and go into salted boiling water. I've got some all ready for us. Let's strain these out and then straight over to the food processor. Now we're ready to add our other ingredients. We're gonna use some red miso paste. This is fermented soybean paste. We need some acid. This is gonna give it a little spark of life and this is about one and a half tablespoons of lemon juice. Oh, can't cook without a little garlic, right? So let's scoop in about one clove of minced garlic. And then, ah, how about some heat? This is a wonderful Asian chili oil. Now it's just a matter of closing up the lid and letting it roar. We can add a little water. That'll help smooth the mixture out. All right, that looks great. Now, to finish this off, we're gonna just take an easy, easy little thing. This is a prepared phyllo shell. We'll take our spoons, Scoop a little bit of our hummus right in, and then we're going to garnish with a little sesame seed. And I'm gonna do it sort of free form here, a little sprinkling, whatever shows up on the platter, hey, it's just good decoration. And then we'll garnish with a couple of our soybeans in the pod. Remember, it's always nice to garnish a dish with something that's an ingredient in the dish. It tells your guests, hey, this is what you're gonna be eating. And what we're eating today, edamame hummus. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I just want to remind you that anything you saw in today's show, from the recipes to ways to use that soybean insulation, can be found on my website, pallensmith.com. Until we're together next time, happy hunting great objects and finding great plants for your garden. From the garden, I'm Alan Smith. This garden I dream of a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile Oh No, I can't help but smile